Gilgamesh chapter 5. This is on page 40 of your textbook. Gilgamesh refuses to marry Ishtar, the goddess of love and fertility. She retaliates by sending the ferocious bull of heaven into Uruk. Gilgamesh and Enkidu kill the bull. Enkidu insults Ishtar and then becomes ill and dies. When Gilgamesh returned to strong-walled Uruk, he cleaned and polished his weapons. He unbraided his dirty hair, washed it, and threw it back loosely over his shoulders. He then changed into clean clothes. Finally, he wrapped his royal fringed cape about his shoulders, fastened it with a sash at his waist, and placed his crown upon his head. When the goddess Ishtar saw Gilgamesh dressed in his royal clothing, she admired his great beauty and said to him, Come marry me, Gilgamesh. You will be my husband, and I will be your wife. She added, I will harness for you a jeweled and golden chariot with golden wheels and brass horns. Storm demons will be your mighty steeds and will pull your chariot. The fragrance of cedar will greet you when you enter our house. Kings, princes, and nobles all will bow before you, kiss your feet, and bring you the fruits of the plains and the hills as tribute. Even the mountains and the plains will pay tribute to you. Your goats will give birth to triplets, your sheep to twins. Your colts will have the strength of burden-bearing mules. The horses that pull your chariot will be famous racers. The ox that pulls your plow will have no equal. And why should I marry you? Gilgamesh asked. You have harmed everyone you have ever loved. Listen, for I am happy to list your lovers for you. You loved Tammuz when you were young, but you left him and caused him to weep year after year. You struck the spotted shepherd bird that you loved and broke his wing. Now, year after year, he stays in the orchard and cries, My wing, my wing. Then you loved a stallion that was famous in war. First you whipped and spurred him into galloping twenty-one miles, and then you made him drink muddy water, causing him to die. His mother still weeps for him. Then, Gilgamesh continued, you loved the herdsman who placed piles of ash cakes at your feet, and every day he killed the finest of his goats for your pleasure. You rewarded his love by striking him and turning him into a wolf. His own shepherd boys drove him away from the flocks, and his hounds bit into his legs. Then you loved your father's gardener of the palm trees. Every day he brought you baskets of ripe dates for your table. You turned him into a mole and buried him in the earth, where he cannot move either up or down. If I let you love me, you would only treat me as poorly as you have treated all of your other lovers. Gilgamesh added, you are like a pan of white-hot coals that go out in the cold. You are like a back door that fails to keep out the blasts of a tempest. You are like a palace that crushes the king within it. You are like a headdress that does not cover the head. You are like an elephant that shakes off its carpet. You are like pitch that blackens the one who carries it. You are like a water skin that soaks the person who carries it. You are like a limestone rock that falls from the stone wall. You are like a shoe that pinches the foot of the one who wears it. Ishtar became enraged as she listened to his words. She went up to heaven and tearfully complained to her father anew. Father, she began, Gilgamesh has hurled great insults upon me. He has recounted to my face all of my wicked deeds. Anu replied, I believe that you started the quarrel and caused Gilgamesh to tell you of your shameful deeds. Undaunted by his criticism, Ishtar pleaded, Father, please give me the bull of heaven and let me use it to kill Gilgamesh. If you refuse, I will break the bolts and smash the gates of the underworld, letting them stand open. I will cause the dead to rise to the world above, where they will eat among the living and outnumber them. Anu replied, If I give you the bull of heaven, there will be seven years of famine in the land of Uruk. Have you gathered and stored enough grain to feed the people through those lean years? Have you grown enough grass for all the animals? Ishtar said, Yes, father, I have stored grain for the people, and I have provided the beasts with grass to last seven lean years. Then Anu gave Ishtar the bull of heaven, and the goddess led the bull into the strong-walled city of Uruk. When the bull snorted, pits opened in the earth, and two hundred young men of Uruk fell into them and died. With its next snort, more pits opened in the earth, and two hundred more men of Uruk fell into them and died. With its third snort, the bull sprang upon Enkidu. Enkidu leaped up and seized the bull of heaven by its horns. 
the bull foamed at the mouth and blew its foam into Enkidu's face. Then it struck him with the tasseled end of its tail. Enkidu held fast, and Gilgamesh came to his aid. As the two heroes fought with the bull, Enkidu chased it and hung on to the thick part of its tail. Gilgamesh finally killed it by thrusting his sword between its neck and its horns. Then the two friends tore its heart from its body and dedicated it to Shamash. Ishtar then climbed upon the strong walls of Uruk and shouted, Woe to Gilgamesh, for he has insulted me by killing the bull of heaven. Upon hearing these words, Enkidu tore off the right thigh of the bull of heaven and threw it in the face of the goddess. If I could capture you as I captured this bull, he shouted to Ishtar, I would treat you as I have treated it. Ishtar then gathered the temple women and mourned over the right thigh of the bull of heaven. Meanwhile, Gilgamesh gathered the armorers, the craftspeople, and the artisans and told them to take the parts of the bull they could use. Gilgamesh himself kept the valuable horns and hung them in his bedroom. He then made an offering of oil to honor his dead father, Lugalbanda. Next, the two friends washed their hands in the Euphrates River and rode together through the market street of Uruk. The people gathered to gaze upon them, and singers sang praises. Gilgamesh asked, Who is the best of the heroes? Who is the most noble among men? The people replied, Gilgamesh is the best of the heroes. Gilgamesh is the most noble among men. That evening, Gilgamesh held a joyous celebration in the palace to mark the victory over the bull of heaven. During the night, Enkidu had a dream. He awakened Gilgamesh and said, My friend, listen to my dream. The great gods, Anu and Enlil, wise Ea and radiant Shamash met together. Anu said to Enlil, Because Gilgamesh and Enkidu have killed Humbaba and the bull of heaven, the one who removed the cedars from the mountain must die. Enlil replied, Gilgamesh will not die, but Enkidu should die. Enkidu's dream made him ill with fear. With the coming of day, he raised his head and wept before radiant Shamash. With tears streaming down his face also, Gilgamesh said, Oh, dear brother, why would the gods spare me and punish you? Will I sit down at the door of the spirits of the dead and never be able to see you, my dear brother, again? Enkidu cursed the events in his life that had brought him to the point of death. Raising his eyes, he said, Oh, you gate to the cedar forest that hurt my hands. How I admired your size and your beautiful, fragrant cedar. Your wood is unsurpassed in all the land. Surely a master craftsman built you. But if I had known, O gate, that your beauty would bring about my death, I would have set upon you with my axe and destroyed you. And Shamash, Enkidu continued, I ask you to destroy the power and wealth of the hunter. May his life displease you. May the beasts escape from the traps he sets. May his heart be sad. Enkidu then said, I curse you, young woman of the temple, most of all and for all time to come. May you never have a house that pleases you. May you eternally be forced to live in the dust of the crossroad. May the desert be your bed. May you be unwelcome where other women gather. May the shadow of a wall give you your only comfort. May thorns and brambles tear at your feet. May the refuse of the road, the dirty and the thirsty, strike your cheek. May the drunkard soil you with his vomit and any place you enjoy. When radiant Shamash heard these words, he called down from heaven, And Kidu, why do you curse the young woman of the temple? She gave you food worthy of the gods and drink worthy of royalty. She clothed, clothed you with fine garments and led you to your best friend, Gilgamesh. The god continued, And has Gilgamesh not treated you like a king? He has given you a royal bed on which to sleep. He has seated you in comfort at his left hand. He has honored you and has encouraged the princes of the earth to kiss your feet. When you die, he will make the people of Uruk weep over you. Sorrow in their hearts will then overcome any thought of joy. He will make his people serve you even after your death. When you depart, Gilgamesh will let his hair grow long and will wander over the grassy plains clad in a lion skin. When Enkidu heard the words of Shamash, his heart became calm. I who have cursed you will now bless you, woman of the temple, he said. May kings, princes, and nobles love you. May you receive jewels and gold. May anyone who does not respect you be punished. 
May poverty find his storehouse and his home. May the priests let you enter the presence of the gods. Still feeling sick, Enkidu lay down all alone. The next morning he said to Gilgamesh, My friend, last night I had another dream. The heavens groaned and the earth replied. While I was standing alone between heaven and earth, a young man with a very dark face and with claws like the talons of an eagle leaped upon me and overpowered me. Then he transformed my arms into the wings of a bird. He led me along the road of no return into the house of darkness and dust, which no one can leave once he has entered it. And Kidu continued, Those who live there dwell in an eternal darkness, and there is no way to return to the land of the living. Their food consists of clay and dust. They are clothed with wings like birds. I saw many people there who had been royalty during their lives on earth. All of the rulers I saw had removed their crowns, for they are of no use in the house of darkness and dust. By the end of the day, following Enkidu's unfavorable dream, he was ill. For the next twelve days he remained in bed, and his suffering increased. Finally, he called Gilgamesh to his side and said, The goddess Ishtar has cursed me. I will not die honorably like one who falls in battle. Gilgamesh cried, May the bear, the hyena, the panther, the tiger, the deer, the leopard, the lion, the oxen, the ibex, and all the wild creatures of the plain weep for you. May your tracks in the cedar forest weep for you unceasingly, both night and day. May the Ula River, along whose banks we used to walk, weep for you. May the pure Euphrates, where we used to draw water for our water skins, weep for you. Gilgamesh continued, May the nobles of strong-walled Uruk weep for you. May the warriors of Uruk weep for you. May those in Uruk who praised your name weep for you. May those who provided grain for you to eat weep for you. May those who put salve on your back weep for you. May those who put beer in your mouth weep for you. May the young women of the temple who put fragrant oil upon you weep for you. Gilgamesh's heart overflowed with grief and loneliness when Enkidu died. The king said, Oh, elders of strong-walled Uruk, listen to me. I weep for my friend Enkidu. I moan bitterly like a wailing woman. An evil demon has robbed me of my dearest friend. He was like the bow in my hand, like the dagger in my belt, like the axe and the sword at my side, like the shield that protects me, like my ceremonial robe, and like my glorious royal decorations. O oh, Enkidu, Gilgamesh said to the body of his dead friend, you chase the wild creatures of the hills and the panther of the grassy plains. Together we conquered all things. We climbed the mountains. We seized and killed the bull of heaven. We overthrew Humbaba, who lived in the cedar forest. What kind of sleep has come upon you in Kidu that you cannot hear me? You do not lift your head. When I touch your heart, it does not beat. Gilgamesh covered his friend in rich clothing and veiled him as a bride is veiled. First he roared over Enkidu's death like a lion. Then he cried over him like a lioness deprived of her cubs. Back and forth before Enkidu's body he paced, tearing out his hair and flinging off his clothing as if it were unclean. With the first glow of dawn, Gilgamesh issued a summons throughout the land for coppersmiths, goldsmiths, jewelers, and engravers. Create a statue of my friend Enkidu, he commanded. Choose jewels for his breast and fashion his body from the purest gold. Then Gilgamesh said to his friend, O oh, Enkidu, I gave you a couch of honor on which to lie. I seated you on a seat of ease at my left, so that the princes of the earth would kiss your feet. I will make the people of strong-walled Uruk weep over your death. These once joyful people will now lament and be sad, and they will perform services for you. And once you are gone, I will let my hair grow long and roam over the grassy plains clad in a lion skin. That concludes chapter 5 of Gilgamesh.